Welcome, I'm Jim Ferris, a professor in the Saul Price School of Public Policy at USC, and I have the distinct pleasure of serving as the director of the USC Center on Philanthropy and Public Policy. On behalf of the Center's Board of Advisors, I'm delighted to welcome you all to this conversation on philanthropy and public libraries. I want to thank Ken for sharing, being willing to share his thoughts about the provocative question, could the 21st century be the golden age of public libraries? And to Judy for her willingness to make sure that we have a lively, interesting, and interactive conversation. If you know Ken and Judy, neither will disappoint. <laughs> um, we're now in the third year of this new series at the center called Conversations on Philanthropy. Many of you have been to other events we've done, like the Leadership Forum, our Distinguished Speaker Series, and even some of our research roundtables that we've been doing for the last 14 years. This series is a little bit different. It's an effort to make sure that we can have more intimate, in-depth conversations on issues that are of keen interest to philanthropy and our community. When we designed this series, we thought it would be 15 or 20 people, but we haven't been successful in keeping it that small to date. Um, but the part of what we're trying to do is bring together a broad spectrum of the philanthropic community. And, you know, with star power like Ken and Judy, um, it's always going to grow. Um, so we're delighted um, to have many of you here today that are providing leadership in the Southern California community. Um, philanthropy has been crucial to developing America's public libraries. A hundred years ago, it was Andrew Carnegie. About 15 years ago, it was Bill Gates. Um, public libraries are sort of instrumental in our communities. A recent Pew report revealed that 91% of respondents said that public libraries are important to their communities. That's a very high level and a lot of confidence in a public institution. Um, today's conversation will examine some of the most innovative ideas and why ask access to not only books but information and new technologies is probably the future of civic engagement and strong communities. So I'm really looking forward to this conversation, Ken and Judy. We're counting on you. Um, no pressure, exactly. Um, I also want to take this opportunity to thank some important folks who have made today possible and who are instrumental in the center's accomplishments. First, I want to thank the members of the board of the center who are here with us today, to the many philanthropic partners who help fund and engage with us about what's needed in the field, and then finally, uh, members of the center's team Farah, Natalia, Nick, and Megan, who make my life a lot easier. And the fact that I see so many friends here, I still feel like I'm a, I'm a newbie in Los Angeles, and uh, many of you um, have um, turned a Bay Area snob into a lover of the City of Angels. So um, I just wanna, wanna thank you all for taking time to join. Um, there's two reasons that I was, I'm excited about today's program, both content and person. Uh, content, uh, I'm really passionate about libraries. Um, although I've spent most of my professional career in California, my roots go back to Alexandria, Virginia, before it was a tourist destination. Mm -hmm. And I grew up in the late 50s and 60s. This is the time for you to do a collective, oh, she can't be that old. <laughs> <laughs> and um, even though I grew up, you know, 10, 10 miles from the White House, my uh, life um, in the not so good ways was dictated by what was happening in Richmond, Virginia. And as I grew up, they had funny ideas about uh, access to public facilities for people who looked like me in terms of access to water, to schools, to swimming pools, to movie theaters. But the one place that always had their doors open uh, 
to the colored folks in town was the library. And we never could figure that out. I mean, we would, in church, the, we'd whisper, you know, they let color folks in the library. Um, didn't quite um, know why that kind of slipped under the radar. But uh, it certainly uh, made an impression on me. And I spent many, many, many hours in the library and, and went on and worked my way through Northwestern uh, working in the Northwestern Library, so it's passionate. But the other reason I was excited is the person um, uh, that we're going to uh, have the pleasure of kind of taking us through the journey, Ken Brecker, who is one of those folks who's uh, helped me really appreciate um, this town. And um, Ken has said, because we've had many, many intense lively conversations um, that I can ask him anything, I can cut him off. Go for it. Uh, and I can disagree with him. So he's my kind of guy yeah. to interview. Yeah. We also, which, you know, my friend um, Bonnie, where is Bonnie, who is a filmmaker but also is teaching me a lot about Buddhist, Buddhism these days, karma in that we, we found out as we were working together that we have two sons. Um, who are destined to be military historians. And we kind of figured out, how did that happen? But that is what they're doing. Uh, so we have lots to um, chat about regarding that. And we actually got the two guys together. Um, but I know you guys are thinking, you know, Belk, um, you, know, uh, you know, this luncheon isn't about you. You're so vain. It's not <laughs> no. about you. Um, but the first question, you know, that I have, and, and we're going to really try to have a conversation. I feel like I almost have to move around a little and have a conversation like we're sitting in our living room okay. with about 50 of our best friends. And you guys will be able to weigh in also. Go for it. Um, you know, Ken, you know, when I first met you, I mean, I liked you. I liked your energy. Uh, you know, we got deep really quickly. I view you as the ultimate renaissance person, road <laughs> scholar, anthropologist. You've head of a foundation, museum artistic director, and all of that. And I would, I really, one of the things I couldn't figure out though, because you headed up Sundance for almost 14 years. You worked really closely, you know, with someone that I've had a crush on for a long time, Robert Redford. Start off telling me why, given all of the the things that you could be doing, including you know, sitting in a room with Robert Redford, um, especially Sunday season, why, what was it about the Los Angeles Library that just struck your fancy? Well, I, it was a surprise to me, actually. Um, I was thinking I would love to have a chance to, if I was really lucky, I'd have a chance to run a small arts college, and there seemed to be an opportunity to do that. And, uh, and I also got a call I'll never forget from the Smithsonian asking whether I was interested in running one of their museums. And I was very interested. Uh, and then I went to see my friend Louise Steinman from the Allowed Authors series at the Los Angeles Public Library. And I told her this. And she said, oh, no, no, you have to come to the library. And I said, well, I haven't been to the library in a long time. And she said, well, there's 72 libraries. Uh, are branch libraries, and you should visit them. You're an anthropologist. Go out and do some field work. Uh, and I did. And what I saw was the most exciting potential and also the realization of everything that I thought mattered most. And, and Sundance was still in my blood at that moment, and I was trying to think about, was I really making the right <laughs> decision? And then it was the last film festival of my 13 or something festivals, and. There was a moment of complete panic in Park City, Utah. And I got a call from the head of security. And he said, uh, I need your advice immediately. And I said, you know, we hired you because you're such a top guy from Washington, a top security person. So I, wouldn't, I never want to hear that in your voice. So <laughs> what is the problem? He said, we have a serious problem, and you have to help us solve it. I said, OK, what is it? And he said, we have two queens. Two queens have arrived to the Sundance Film Festival at the same time. And they both need security at this moment. And we don't have enough for both of them. And you have to decide which of the queens gets the full security detail. <laughs> I said, calm down. Who are the queens? 
And he said, on the right-hand side of Park Street, the right-hand side of the street, Main Street in Park City, we have uh, the Queen of Jordan. And on the left-hand side, we have Queen Latifah. <laughs> I said, there is no question in my mind. Queen Latifah is our queen. She, she gets the full security. And she did. <laughs> and enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. And um, so it was a big change at the library. But when I started going to the branches and volunteering in the branches, spending time at uh, 103rd and Compton and Venice and uh, in Fairfax and across the city, I saw things that I just loved. I thought, this is what we're supposed to be as a people. This is how we're supposed to work. This is the spirit of generosity. And this is a trusted institution which has its issues. We all, we all know the issues of the great American institutions. And at that moment, there were a lot of issues. Lots of questions about whether the city government could continue to fund it and what would happen with property taxes. And we're going into a recession. And, but there was something there that I hadn't seen in just about anywhere else. And I saw a couple of moments that, to me, became the sort of strength of everything that uh, I wanted to do. But the Library Foundation, to tell yeah, what you, are, what does the library? It is, a, it is a private foundation. We're not the library. It's a private foundation with a private board. Um, some of those board members are here. I'm happy to say today, uh, and we're a private foundation with a public purpose. The, we have a great city library, an absolutely fantastic city library, and John Zabo, who he came from Atlanta. He right? came from Atlanta, and mm -hmm. I went right to Atlanta to see whether what they said was true, and boy, was it true. He did a spectacular job there. He was just to walk around that city with him. It was like walking around uh, with one of the great leaders of, a, of, a, of an entire city, not just a library system. Uh, and his love for Los Angeles in just his first year is already, it's like yours. I mean, he's found something that he really connects and understands with. And the Library Foundation is a private foundation, as I said. But the notion is that we could be what I think we all do in philanthropy, we could perhaps be a little bit ahead of the curve, or we could be the, the first responders, or maybe the people who lead this particular initiative. We are very excited by the priorities of the public library, and that's what we respond to. But Ken, let, let's talk a little bit about that, because one of the interesting discussions that we, we have, I'm, I'm warming up to the idea, but you often talk about the, the public library as a social change institution. And I have to say, even though I'm a big supporter of the library, if someone asks me to talk about institutions of social change, I'm not so sure that I put the library on that list, but so convince me and maybe other skeptics. Why do you believe that not only the LA Public Library, but public library in, in general should and could be viewed as agents of social change? Well, if you are a person who um, might like to become a citizen of the United States at this moment, you could walk into any one of our 73 libraries, 72 branch libraries, plus the Central Library right next door, and you would find a little corner called a citizenship corner, just a little corner. And in that corner, you'll find other people who are also interested. And um, when we put those corners in, I say we, I'm speaking here as the public library, not for the library, but as people who support and love the library. When we put those corners in, um, we had no idea what was going to happen. Thousands and thousands and thousands of people in this city have come to their trusted branch libraries and applied for citizenship. And the great surprise to many people is that close to 90% of those people who have applied are eligible. But they've never applied before. They've never felt comfortable applying before. They didn't feel sure enough about going into the other places where they could apply. They weren't sure what if they made a mistake, or what if they got the wrong, what if they didn't have their mother's birth certificate, what if their cousin wasn't eligible the way they were, what could happen? But they could trust the library. Or if since October 1st, you've really wondered, what am I, how am I ever going to understand affordable care, the new Affordable Care Act, you can walk into any one of our libraries and there is somebody there who is ready and happy to answer your questions and refer you to people who are trained to answer your questions. Uh, this is an incredible institution which says there are things that everybody at this moment needs to know more about, and we're going to be the people that lead toward those answers. I don't know where else that happens at this moment. We can pay for it, um, but very often 
you can't get it for free. If you walk in and you're a person who is really, truly interested in being a member of the society in which you live in, or if you walk in and you're a person who's looking for a place to sit down that's warm, or if you're a young child who needs that moment to have a tutor, or you're an adult who's really having, struggling with English and can't follow the English, you don't know whether your mail is junk mail or a letter that you have to read because your English isn't good enough, the place to go is the public library. But Karen, we're kind of, what, a few minutes in the conversation, you haven't mentioned the B word, books. How, how does that, how does that fit in? And, and I, I have to say, when, when you took me on a site visit of the library, when I first came to town, the longest line was not really checking out the books or the reference library. It was outside the computer access. It's room. the most. And, it's, and is that the appropriate role? Oh, my book? goodness, is it ever. The most wonderful thing that's happened to libraries since Gutenberg's printing press is technology. Everybody is reading. Absolutely. It's not the death of libraries. It's the, oh no. It's the golden age that's right before us. Everybody is reading. They're reading on their phones. They're reading on their computers. They're using the library in exactly the way it's always been used, as a place where you can get access to information that you might not be able to afford or know about. Mm -hmm. It's the most wonderful thing that's happened to libraries. And we have almost 3,000 free computers spread throughout the system. And if you can get your hands on a phone, which most people can find a way to get their hands on a phone, if, even if they have to bother, borrow one, you can also get yourself a free tutor through the technology of the library. Books aren't going anywhere. Books are here to stay. We love our books. And, they're, and if, you, if you really want to have a great experience, make a friend, find a librarian who will allow you to watch the routing of the books. Do you know what this is? Every Monday morning, they converge in the stacks of the library, the central library, and the books are routed. So if your branch is Sherman Oaks, or you're in East LA, or you're in Boyle Heights, or Lincoln Heights, or Cahuenga, or you're in San Pedro, 400 square miles of libraries, and you want to read a book on a particular subject, it has to be routed to you. And the librarians have all that. And what is absolutely fascinating is what people are reading in the different communities. If you think you know what people are reading in East LA, I'm here to tell you you don't know. What are they reading? They're reading economics, law. <laughs> I mean, what law. They are reading the most, the most important. What everybody was reading a few months ago was Moby Dick throughout the entire system. Do you know about this? No, tell me about that. The Library Foundation, uh, I went to the city librarian and said, what if we picked one book and we got very excited about it and we thought about it from a California point of view? Can we read a work? If we watch a movie and that movie's supposed to be in New York, we say, that's not New York, that's Culver City. We know where that is. They filmed that around the corner from that place we used to go to. And um, we read a book, we read it differently because we live in California. We have a different feeling about the environment. We have relationships which are different. We see the country in a different way because we live here. And so we thought this will be an interesting experiment. And the city librarian said, let's go for it. And we created 90 public events. Every one of them was sold out in the public libraries across the, across the whole system. And people came together around the novel Moby Dick. And the reading, people, I mean, was it what went on in East LA? around Moby Dick was fantastic. And I went to these sessions and I said, what is it about Moby Dick? And people said, everybody's got an Ahab in their life. It's usually your boss. <laughs> and everybody's got a white whale that they've been chasing for a long time and they better stop chasing it. I thought, yes, that's absolutely true. We did a summarizing Moby Dick Twitter contest. It went out to 1.5 million people. You should see what came in, it was so fantastic. We did a whale watch. We partnered with the uh, aquarium in Long Beach. And David Eulin, the literary critic of the LA Times, reading aloud on the speaker system on the, on the whale watch boat from Moby Dick, filled with people, and two whales, two whales, rose up in front of the boat while he was, while he was reading Melville's words. It was people just screamed. and Some people were there. It was just so fantastic. <laughs> It was, I mean, the city is crazy for books. It's crazy for reading. It's crazy for film. It's a city that loves the new, that embraces the new. And it's going on in every single community. So going back to just kind of the changes in the overall um, mission, because it sounds like it's a lot of exciting things happening. The last time we talked, you said that there was even a role 
for the library around affordable health care? Oh, there absolutely is. Uh, and there are uh, wonderful philanthropists in this room who've been helping us think that through. Um, there's no question that people um, need a place that they can go to and a person they can talk to about that. And there are wonderful, wonderful agencies and groups that have been empowered to talk about it. But people often can't find them. They need to find someone in their own language. Mm -hmm. um, we're doing a pilot program in Chinatown at this moment, uh, which is very exciting, and, and uh, another one in Pacoima, which is very exciting to us, where we're learning that uh, what the questions people are asking are the right questions. But if they have direct contact with agencies which uh, know their needs and understand their language, they can move much more quickly through into the system and find the care which they deserve, which we all deserve. You know, I, I want to leverage a little bit your anthropology and history background um, because philanthropy has played a role in public libraries. Um, the most interesting conversation we had where you talked about, you know, Carnegie um, having such a claim for um, starting the libraries, but he did three things wrong, you said. Well. And then, so I want you to talk about what he did right, what he did wrong, and then kind of help us understand if we were sitting here, you know, 50 years from now, you know, how will the vision, the library, even be different from it is today? But start, oh, with, start with Carnegie getting it wrong. What were the three things? Well, I think wrong? we all, I think we all get it wrong, I and mean, I think the greatest philanthropists uh, often get it wrong. We do one part of it we get right, and another part of it we just never really understood in our own times, and we understand it later. Uh, I, I knew a woman who in her in her 90s who was one of the great philanthropic figures in England, and she, sped, she said she spent her entire you know the first 30 or 40 years in philanthropy fighting to get uh, children with disabilities out of public schools in England, the state schools in England, and into private schools which dealt with their needs. And then she spent the last 20 years fighting to get them back into the schools that she had fought to get them out of. Um, we all, you know, things, we under, our understanding changes. Carnegie was a dreadful man. Uh, he beat his workers. He, he called in Pinkerton uh, to, to stop his workers from, from for striking for living wages. They worked 12, hours a day. He uh, had no, he said, I'm an immigrant, and they're immigrants, and I know I can't trust them. And if I gave them anything more than a barely living wage, bare wage, they'd spend it on drink, or they'd try and live the high life. And this was the man speaking from his mansion on, you know, Fifth Avenue in New York. On the other hand, he loved church organs. You could get a church organ by writing him a letter for your church, and he, thousands of them went out across the country. And he loved libraries. And he said, uh, you know, I'm going to build libraries, but you have to do them in my way. You have to build them with my architectural plans. I want to see Greek. I want to see classics. I want to see the Baroque style. I'm, I'm, uh, occasionally, I'll allow a little Spanish in there, but not really. Um, you have to um, agree to, for in perpetuity to pay 10% of the cost of the construction of the library. I will build your library. He built almost 2,000 of them across the country. And some here in LA? Yes, three still exist. Which uh, ones are those? Cahuenga, uh, Lincoln Heights, and, Vernon's, and uh, Vermont Square. Um, and they're beautiful. And he said there has to be a delivery desk, a big oak desk where the librarian sits. Mm -hmm. And when people come in, I want that librarian to look everybody over because you've got to be very careful because those immigrants will steal you blind. And if they get into the stacks, you'll never see those books again. But so many of the immigrants who went to the libraries had never been in a public library before. It's a very new thing in America. And uh, they walked right around the delivery desk, the big oak desk, and took the books out. And to everyone's amazement, including Mr. Carnegie, as it was pronounced, they circulated. Can you imagine? They brought them back and took other ones out. And then he told somebody, you know, there's one thing that I'm absolutely sure of. I'm sure of it. No women librarians. You know what happens to them. I love my wife, he said. I love my daughter. But they get pregnant and they leave. They can be clerks and they can be typists. But not really librarians. No, there's not a single library in the world that can open without, <laughs> without women. And by the way, this is really exciting. One of the things I've just learned about Los Angeles is that the reason we have a public library system and had Carnegie supporting it here was because of women's clubs in Los Angeles. 80% of the libraries that got built by Carnegie 
were supported by women and women's clubs who went to their city government and said to the, to, and said to the city fathers, in those cases, we need to change the tax structure so that 10% so we can pay. Mr. Carnegie will give us $100,000 to build a library. But we have to have 10% every year after that. So how can we do that? And the women's clubs began, and right after the Civil War, they became very active in Los Angeles. And they thought, there should be a woman librarian here. And they picked a fantastic woman. And I just read all about her. And her name was Kelso, Tessa Kelso. And she was shocking. It was 1894. She, she bobbed her hair, and she smoked a cigarette in public. And they'd never seen anything. And he loved kids, too, right? <laughs> <laughs> Andrew Carnegie was very, very worried about kids in the library and, and uh, did a lot to discourage children in the library. There's, uh, there's, a, wonderful, um, there's a, a wonderful account of a board meeting record from 1901. The Manhattan Library risked everything and um, put in a children's room. And then they closed it a couple of weeks later. And it says in the minutes of the board, there was noise on the stairs. <laughs> uh, the, the Carnegie libraries were also in many ways progressive. These were Mr. Carnegie's problems, right. and they got around them pretty quickly. Um, at one point, over half of the public libraries in America, when he finished his philanthropy, th there were 35,000 libraries in America, and over half of them had been built by him. Mm -hmm. I mean, he was a really extraordinary philanthropist. But he, there was a lot he didn't understand, and I asked myself, what don't we understand? What is, it that, what is it that we're missing at this moment? When you walk into a library, and you see a person in uniform, and that's the uniform of the Los Angeles public, of the LAPD, is that the first thing we want people to see? There's a library system in, just outside of Denver, which is now put in concierges on every floor, and they're actually doing a fantastic job, mm -hmm. amazing job. Um, there are library systems that we've been visiting all over the country, including New York. And what that, are the trends, what's happening? The trend is to take the technology and use it in a way that builds a greater engagement with the library. So give me a, a couple of examples of what's really Well, it's exciting. one of the things we're doing here. Uh, the Library Foundation of Los Angeles uh, is the major funder of a free tutor for every student in Los Angeles with a library card. If you have a library card, you can have a free tutor seven days a week from three in the afternoon till 10 o'clock at night, seven days a week in math, science, social studies, and English and you can have that tutor. None of the tutors are volunteers. They're all paid teachers, PhDs, college professors, high school teachers. Everyone is paid by us. Uh, so how many kids are getting tutored? That's thousands. Great. Wow. Thousands. Okay. And it's fantastic. If you go to a high school in Los Angeles that doesn't teach calculus, which many don't, and you can't get into a four-year college without calculus, we will teach you calculus every day of the week. And we save the homework. We save the homework. It's all done online. So if you can get to a phone in the Y, if you can get to one of our libraries, if you can borrow a computer from a friend or from a relative, if you, you can do it on your phone. If you're writing a book report about Jane Austen and there's nobody in your family who's ever read a book by mm -hmm. Jane Austen, or you're, you're, in, you're doing really well in algebra, but you just can't do the last problem and it's mm -hmm. nine o'clock at night and the homework is due at eight o'clock tomorrow morning, we have a tutor waiting for you at nine o'clock at night who will say, well, you've, didn't, you've done this before. We have your homework right here from last week. We'll take you through it again. It's absolutely fantastic what it's meant to people. It feels, um, which I mean, I'm supportive of all of these programs. I mean, the, the uh, naturalization program, the citizenship program, affordable care or what. But is that, I'll go back to it. Do you think that's an appropriate role and mission for the library? And, are, and is LA reflective of what's happening across the country in terms of the changing roles? Of libraries. There was a moment last summer where um, there were just too many hungry kids in the library. Mm -hmm. They were hungry. We had a thousand kids in the summer reading program. We have a summer reading program, 12 and under, 12 and above. The 12 and under kids at the Central Library, there were almost a thousand kids there last summer in the summer reading program. And, uh, and there were large numbers of kids who were walking over from just mm -hmm. three or four blocks from here who were arriving at the library without breakfast. And uh, there was no sign of lunch. They can get it during the school year. I mean, it's very hard to read a book if you're hungry. And um, the library started feeding children in the library. Uh, and there was a, a partner, one of, uh, uh, one of our major donors, one of our board members, who came up to me and he said, this is mission creep. Mm. 
He said, I have no objection to feeding hungry children, but not in the library. That is not the job of the library, and that is not the mission of the library, to feed hungry children. I said, it's the mission of anyone mm -hmm. who knows a hungry child. It's every one of our missions. Mm -hmm. It's not a question in my mind of mission creep. It's a question of what more can we do, and how fast can we do it? We have the lowest graduation rate of any urban library, uh, any urban school system in this country, you have a better chance of graduating in Detroit than you do in Los Angeles? Under 30% in many communities? We're running after school programs in every one of our libraries. We're putting student zones in every one of our libraries. We're doing a student smart program, which is preparing eighth graders for high school because they're not prepared to go to high school. Um, this, is our, this is our moment. This is our job, and it doesn't, you know, we're all doing it. It's not just the library. There's nobody in this room who isn't involved in some aspect of what I'm talking about. But this is our moment, and if we don't do it, who's going to do it? It's about philanthropy. You know, our metrics have got to include the human heart. Our metrics have got to include acts of generosity. We have to judge people. Someone said to me the other day who runs a major foundation in Los Angeles, the Latino community is not generous, is not philanthropic until after they've been here for three generations. I said, really? I've never seen anybody who, in the Latino community, if you went up to them and said, my daughter's about to have her quinceanera, about to have her 15th birthday, if you could help me out, everybody reaches in their pocket. I see people trying to get jobs in front of the hardware store, giving people half of their lunch. That's philanthropy. You know, sometimes it's about feeding people. Sometimes it's about helping someone. John Zabo and I were standing in the, the city librarian and I were standing in the central library last week and a man came in who was so down and out. That's the only way I can describe him. And he needed a free computer and he was in very bad shape. And the librarian just treated him with such respect and said, how can I help you? And, I need a computer, he said. He said, absolutely, there's one right there and it's available right now. I'll walk you, I'll show you, it's right there, sir. And I said to John, that's so wonderful that's going on in our library. He said, that man's here just as much for the respect as he is for the computer. Because there's nobody on the street that's gonna look at that guy and treat him with respect at this yeah. moment. They're gonna keep their distance from him. Okay, you're convincing me. Um, <laughs> We, uh, I want to kind of engage you in questions, so begin thinking about questions you might have. You know, the greatest compliment you can give a speaker is to ask a question. Um, but I want to ask a couple more. Okay. Um, one, let's say I'm on board with this expanded mission. Um, it takes money, resources. So help me understand what the public part of the, f the library means in terms of funding. I mean, what is the responsibility of government and others to, to support the library? And, you know, how does private philanthropy play a role and how should those resources, because there are some who feel that, you know, it's a public library, the, you know, the government should be paying for it. And as you know, you know, folks were very excited when we provided additional support uh, a couple of years ago to extend the hours of the library for Proposition 11. Uh, measure... Measure 11. Yeah. Um, that that, the L. Pa that measure passed... L. That, measure L. That passed uh, in 2011 mostly because of private philanthropy. Um, the greatest funders of the committee which advocated for the mm -hmm. passage of that was private, was private philanthropy. Actually, the Library Foundation used a portion of its endowment to do that. And it was a broad coalition of support. It was a broad coalition of support, except the, the, the uh, it was very interesting, because the, uh, the, the Chamber of Commerce was against it. This is when the libraries were cut back to five days a week, uh, and um, severe cutbacks. Uh, and the uh, League of Women Voters came out against it, too. And I remember going to speak at the League of Women Voters meeting and they, they object because they said this is ballot box uh, politics and we don't want we don't want build, budgeting through the ballot box this is not the way to do things and i said i may even agree with you about that but my mother who was a member of the league of women voters is turning in her grave at this moment to see you uh, coming out against public mm -hmm. libraries uh, 
it was really something. Um, but people stood up and said, we love our libraries. They didn't talk about the system. They didn't talk about 400 square miles of libraries or any of the programs. They said, that's the library where my mother goes on the afternoons. That's the library where my son is safe after school because I can't get home from work until 6.30. And if my son is in the library, I know he's OK. Um, people saw them as the hub of a community. They saw them as the heart of a community. And they voted overwhelmingly to restore, uh, to, uh, to increase the, the percentage of the public budget. So why does the public library need a private library foundation? Because it does nothing more than turn on the lights, and, and it's a lot. It turns on the lights, it pays librarian salaries, it helps with the purchase of books, but not the programs of the library. So running one of the largest adult literacy programs in Los Angeles within the public libraries is all paid for by private philanthropy, um, by, philanth by people in this room. Mm -hmm. um, all of the programs are not, the programs are not paid for by the city. Okay. The, the city does, opens the doors and supports the librarians. Um, and thank goodness they do. And one last question before I turn. I'll give an example. You and I work together um, with, with a donor who is providing support for a pretty national, this is, innovative This is uh, an project. amazing, this is one of the most exciting things that's, hap that's happened in any library, and everybody's talking about it. If you're in the library field, you know about this, and you're talking about it. And here's what it is. Uh, we heard about a donor in Northern California who was giving, correct me if I've got this wrong, mm -hmm. I think, I, who was offering to help uh, pay the, the, uh, the student loans mm -hmm. of students in the education school at Stanford if they would agree to teach for a number of years, three years, mm -hmm. in the public schools. Or any underserved school. Uh, underserved schools. Mm -hmm. And uh, I went to speak with her, and I said to her, there's a whole group of people graduating from library schools right now who want to be public librarians. They want to be standing there and say, how can I help you? They love information. They love books. They love technology. But they love service. They love the service element. It's a vocation for them. But we're cutting back. Our, our city government, in its, in its wisdom, has just cut the libraries back. There's no hiring going on. We're going to lose those people. We need to be able to hold on to them. We need to create a model program which can be copied in other parts of the country where we recognize that people leaving library school are absolutely essential to the future of libraries. And we need to give them fellowships where they can come and work in a public library system paid for by private philanthropy but be matched up with a mid-career librarian who may not have all the technology skills they have, but really knows how to serve the public and has the experience of that. And let's build innovation teams and give them small amounts of money where they can try out new ideas that will do a better job of serving the public. And this, the Bay Tree Fund, this very generous philanthropist in Northern California, said, let's give it a try. And it has been amazing. And New York, the New York Public Library has just been here. The New York Public Library, which considers, considers itself the jewel in the crown, okay. um, has just sent their top people here for a week to observe how we're, how we're doing the innovation in Los Angeles. Um, we're working with Seattle. We're working with a wonderful group in, in Colorado right outside of, of Denver, a very, very progressive small system. We're working in New Haven, which is doing very interesting work on citizenship, very different than ours. We're working in Arizona. I mean, these are people who are saying, What's going on in Los Angeles? We need to learn from you, and you need to learn from us, because we've found something that you might be able to lose. Great. Good. Well, we, I, I have many, many questions, but I am going to turn it over to you. Are there questions? And I would ask that if you raise your hand, if you could just say who you are, and then please make it a question. Yes? Okay, Nancy Berman um, from the Philip and Muriel Berman Foundation. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. How coordinated are you with the school system in Los Angeles in terms of them knowing about your tutoring programs and do they do all the teachers or uh, tell their students that this resource is available and encourage participation? The, 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 it's not our program. This is the programs of the public library. I always say our because we're so invested in them, mm -hmm. but um, I don't speak for the library. I'll say it again, but I work, my office is there and I work hand in hand with librarians that I could not admire more. Um, we're, librarians spend thousands of hours every year in the school system. Um, what's happening that was very, very interesting, as you may have read recently, the schools are cutting back on their libraries and not employing librarians. In Manhattan, the New York Public Library has decided to become the de facto library system for the public schools of Manhattan. Is that a good idea? I don't think it's a good idea. Okay. Uh, myself, because the moment you 
the moment you agree to that, it's over. For the, you'll, ne the libraries will never return to the schools. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's the way to do it. And the other thing which I, and I said this to Tony Marks, the president of the New York Public Library, I think the mistake there, the books are being delivered, you order the books on computers in the Manhattan school system, and they're delivered from the New York Public Library to the schools. But for the first time, the teachers are looking at what the kids are reading. <laughs> And the parents are looking at what the kids are reading. And one of the great things about a public library is that it's your private relationship with that library. So a 13-year-old young man who's asking all sorts of questions about his life can come in and order and look at any book. And, and, and no one's saying to him, you shouldn't be reading that, or that's a bad idea, or does this mean you're gay, or does that, why would you order that book? Mm -hmm. None of that goes on in the public library. There's tremendous, some years ago, um, our government asked the American Library Association, asked the libraries in America to provide the government with the names of everyone who checked out particular books in the public library or went to particular websites. Uh, and the American Library Association said, we will close every library in America before we will provide that information. People have a right to walk into their library and read anything they want. Um, that great female librarian, Tessa Kelso, got into trouble in Los Angeles in, in 1894 because she decided to introduce French novels <laughs> into the public library of Los Angeles, which was then in City Hall. Yeah. And that was preached against in the, uh, in the churches of, of downtown. And she was, brought, she was brought in and told that no French novels were proper reading for a proper girl in Los Angeles, yeah. proper woman in Los right, Angeles. Go. Before I take another question, I just want to pause for a moment to uh, acknowledge two library commissioners that we have with us, Commissioner Walters and Commissioner Cal. Could you just stand and just be acknowledged for your volunteer service? <laughs> really appreciate it. Thank you. OK, other questions? Yes, Clara. Hi, Clara Peeps from the Durfee Foundation. Um, so Measure L was a great success for which we're grateful, but it seems that the um, tax, the, the debate about tax cuts are kind of predictably, predictably cyclical. Uh, one of the best videos and stories I've seen in the last couple of years is the one of Troy, Michigan. And if you haven't seen it, go to YouTube and just put in Troy Library. An absolutely fantastic story about how with very little budget, the Troy Library, the Troy community fought the Tea Party to keep their library open. But I'm just, I want to hear about um, kind of broader public relations and communications strategies so that we can get ahead of the crisis, so that people are always keeping the library at the kind of the top of the priority list and not just in a responsive mode when the tax cuts come. Well, that's really a question for John Zabo. That's a question for a mm -hmm. city librarian. Um, he thinks a lot about that. The, the Measure L passage has really been terrific for the library. Uh, we're in very good shape. Our numbers are off the chart. As a result of Measure L, what happened? Um, the libraries have been able to reopen again. They'll open to seven days a week starting January 1st, I believe it is. Um, and the, the, we're rehiring and hiring. Uh, it's a very, there's a, it's a, a sense of great optimism in the public library system in Los Angeles, which does not exist in other places. So much so that we're training other library systems now so that when other library systems wanted to be able to help people with the Affordable Care Act, they came from Pasadena, they came from Malibu, they came from all over Southern California to be, be trained by our librarians, which is a great sign for us. Mm -hmm. We're all, you know, the Beverly Hills Library is fantastic. It's not part of our system, but it's terrific. Mm -hmm. The West Hollywood Library, the new library in West Hollywood is, a, that's a jewel, absolutely beautiful. And, Terrific people there. I mean, there's wonderful work that's going on in Santa Monica. Love that library system. But we should all be, you know, we're all toiling in the same vineyard here. Mm -hmm. uh, let's, let's get it together. And th that's really what we have to do. It's partnerships. That's, that's the key. A couple more questions? Yes. Clara, asking you, going on that question of partnerships, how often does the Library Foundation, thank you, um, how often does the Library Foundation ever um, bring together funders around particular sort of initiatives that the libraries wish to put out. I mean, a lot of this is new to me. I didn't realize that the libraries did so much. I mean, I could use the tutor for my kids. <laughs> um, but I, I just mean in terms of um, those are areas that we fund, but we don't know about. So is there, does the Library Foundation ever bring together funders around issues yeah, and to you say? Know, that, that goes back to what um, Claire said about kind of the communication no, we, and the outreach. We have, a, we, have a, um, we have to do a much better job of that. Um, we have to do a much better job of communicating what we do. I think this is, we've just hired our first ever director of communications. She's fantastic, fantastic. But 
for the, for the Library Foundation so that the programs of the library can be communicated even more than they've done so. Mm -hmm. um, we need, we need, we have a, we have a tremendous responsibility there. I mean, it, what, what keeps me up, what gets me out of bed in the morning is that I love my job. What keeps me up at night is that I'm worried that the programs which we're, which we're supporting, which we're all supporting in this room, are not getting used to the degree that they need to be used. We have to address these issues immediately. We don't, we really don't have the time. You know, um, Ken, I'm curious, not that I'm competitive, but I am competitive and I've um, sort of, as I said, really now adopted uh, Los Angeles. I mean, how would we, how does Los Angeles library stack up or compare to other, li other libraries of major cities. I know Jenny Cooper, who just recently retired you know, from Washington, D.C., did an amazing job. But how are, I mean, what, are we viewed as an, as an innovative um, you know, public library system? Well, it's starting to happen. Um, we, we went off and asked the Warhol Foundation, um, which had never funded the library, whether they would come and support us to work directly with artists and to use our collections in a different way, and they said absolutely. We went to the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation recently and said, we're doing work with scientists. They only form, they support science. That's their main interest. Uh, and um, I said, we're doing work, the Moby Dick Project, which I talked to them about. Mm -hmm. They said, well, this is fantastic. You've got real scientists, mm -hmm. real scientists, mm -hmm. coming to public libraries. You've got Caltech involved. You've got all these people involved. Of course we're going to support this. Um, what we're finding, and it's a really interesting, it's a really interesting moment because there are things that we do really well. If you go to New York and you say to the New York Public Library, what are your treasures? They'll say, well, we have the only letter known to have been written by Co Christopher Columbus. We have you know, more first folios than you can count. We've got Virginia Woolf's cane. We've got uh, Malcolm X's briefcase. We have the first editions of every important children's book in the history of children's literature. And you come to Los Angeles and you say, what are their treasures? We say, have you been to the branch in Sherman Oaks? Have you been to Studio City? Have you seen Boyle Heights? Boyle Heights is a jewel. Boyle Heights is amazing. You walk into the branch in Boyle Heights, and on the wall is a photograph of every student in Boyle Heights who has graduated from high school in the last 10 years. I mean, that is an accomplishment in Boyle Heights. That's no small accomplishment. I, it's, it's, a, it's an incredible branch. Um, Expo is an amazing branch. Those are our jewels. San Pedro is extraordinary. Chinatown, Chinatown branch gives scholarships. If they see a young person in that branch coming all the time to do their work, to do research, they have a scholarship pool, which the Friends of the Library puts together, and they give scholarships every year. And I just went to the banquet of the Chinatown Friends, and who do you think got half the scholarships this year? Latinos. I thought it would be all Chinese. That's my ignorance. That's my ignorance. But we also have, you've, you've also shared some great treasures that the library has in terms, you have an art collection. We have an amazing, we, we also have a first folio. Right. I mean, we've got wonderful things. We have a great, have you heard about the songs in the key of LA? We've got these. The sheet music collection of 30,000 people. And how about people. the photography, the, the neighborhood 4. photography? 4.3 million images, the, the Security Pacific collection, the, the Herald Examiner collection. We've got, the, our goal over the next five years, and John Zabo and I are linked, we're, 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 we're conjoined on mm -hmm. this one. Um, we are determined to bring that collection forward to the public. We're doing an exhibition with the Getty, our partner, the Getty Research Institute, which opens on May 1st about Union Station. And in that exhibit, we're going to look at why it was that Chinatown got torn down to build Union Station and what happened when Chinatown moved over two streets and for the first time in the history of the United States, the Chinese community owned their own stores and owned their own houses. So they lost what they had, but they got something that no other Chinese American population had at that moment. There's really interesting things that we're going to show the, we're going to show the drawings for, for Union Station on its 75th anniversary, which have never been seen by the public before. They're among, among the most beautiful architectural drawings I've ever seen. And the other night at the library, someone asked Edie Broad, if you were beginning to collect today, if you were just a young person with limited resources and you, could, you wanted to collect something in the art world, what would you collect? And do you know what she said? Architectural drawings. You can get them for a song and pick your favorite architects or young architects on the way up and you'll see what happens to your collection. I thought it was how a very we, interesting response. How are we doing on time? Can I, can 
Can I keep going? Oh, great. Oh, good. Any other questions before I just keep going? Um, talk um, a little bit about um, an area that I'm personally interested in, kind of the writer, the, the authors of... Um, oh, the, the authors, the authors... Series, it's just... The um, Allowed series is absolutely amazing. This woman came in from Liberia. We sort of loved her book, but nobody ever heard of her. She came on a Monday, and she won the Nobel Peace Prize on Friday. <laughs> Uh, and who was Margaret that? Atwood. I mean, it's just amazing. It was, we we had uh, you know Albie Sachs, the great freedom fighter, who, who was Mandela's lawyer, was there last week. Um, uh, there's just an, there was my favorite moment is the Stephen Breyer moment, mm -hmm. where uh, Justice Breyer came in. He'd written a very interesting book, and he needed he had an hour to kill. I said, you can use my office. Please use my office. And there he was on the phone and talking to his son. He called his son who's, I think, a little bit younger than I am. He called his son Darling, which I loved. Mm -hmm. um, uh, he, he just loves his boy. And um, he's a great guy. And I heard uh, one of the custodians outside my door, um, who's a good friend of mine, Jerome McCants, Mr. McCants. And Mr. McCants said, I know who's in Ken's office. I thought, oh, is Justice Breyer hearing this? No, he's not. He's on the phone with his boy. I, he said, uh, I know who Ken's got in his office. It's that big shot judge from... Washington. I'd like to ask that guy a question. I'd like to ask him why the little guy always does time and those big shots never go to jail. That's what I'd like to ask him. And I heard his broom go against my door. And so <laughs> half an hour later we came out and there was Mr. McCants down the other end and I said, Justice Breyer, I'd like you to meet Jerome McCants. And Mr. McCants came over holding his broom. And I said, Mr. McCants, I believe you have a question for Justice Breyer. He said, I do. He said, sir, why isn't justice blind? Beautiful, that's beautiful. Why isn't justice blind? And Breyer said, uh, well, we're the problem. Humans are the problem. We're so flawed, we're so flawed. We can't see it when it's right in front of us. And they nodded at each other and had a little hug. <laughs> I took a picture uh, and they went on their way. <laughs> Um, it's a wonderful moment. The, the, the author, people don't say no to the library. I, I, I asked the head of one of the great series in New York, how do you get people to come to, he said the key is don't pay them. The moment you start to pay, they won't come. But if you say it's the library. Last week, or a couple weeks ago, we had Vince Gilligan. Who knows who Vince Gilligan is? What? We're the only people in Los Angeles who don't know who Vince Gilligan is. Really, we have work to do. People. Okay, who is he? He is the writer and producer and showrunner of Breaking Bad, the most celebrated show on American television. We are the only people who don't know this, by the way. My, my assistant looked at me and said, you don't know who Vince? Uh, um, so Vince Gilligan came to the library. He was amazing. I mean, people were fighting to get in to see him. And I asked him, are libraries part of your life? He said, I'm a writer. I did X-Files in the Sherman Oaks branch, and I did Breaking Bad in the Glendon branch on right or off of Wilshire, right across from the Hammer Museum. <laughs> so writers, writers still love their libraries. Yeah. Two questions to wrap up. First, um, you know, you have had the benefit of, you know, being a part, you are a part of the philanthropic sector, but you ran a foundation. Um, you've ran an institute that depended on philanthropic. You're now at Library Foundation where you have to interact with donors. How does, I'm just curious, how does the feel of philanthropy and look sort of from your vantage point as someone who has kind of moved in our circles and you've seen it from a variety of different sides? Any just observations um, that you have about our feel as it relates to your work? Well, I'm, I, 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 I love that you're asking me this because it's actually something I'm writing about at the moment. And uh, I found, I, I've been getting up very, very early to try and write before our day starts very early at the library. So I've been writing in the early hours and I actually found a quote that I think describes the philanthropic community. And uh, I love this quote and I, I've been carrying it around with me um, because it's sort of what's holding me in there uh, and making me feel Ken, more. Ken, are you going to share the quote? I'm going to do it. Okay. I always have it in my pocket. Uh, I usually keep it in my backpack, but I have it in my pocket today. 
I'm going to read it to you. It's by, it's by Mark Halpern. It's from a book called, it's from a novel. It's not actually a very good novel. Um, but the quote is fantastic. Okay. The novel's called The Ant Proof Case. He's a wonderful writer, but it's just not his best book. But I saw this on the last page, and I just, I thought, this is, what, this is who we are as philanthropists. And if we hold on to this, we'll do the right thing. We'll make the right decision. But we've got to hold on to this. I need to hold on to this. <laughs> I was graduated from the finest school, which is that of the love between parent and child. Though the world is constructed to serve glory, success, and strength, one loves one's parents and one's children despite their failings and weaknesses, sometimes even more on account of them. In this school, you learn the measure not of power, but of love, not of victory, but of grace not of triumph, but of forgiveness. You learn as well, and sometimes as I did, you learn early, that love can overcome death, and that what matters, and that what is required of you, I'm gonna start that line again, it always gets to me. You learn as well, and sometimes as I did, you learn early, that love can overcome death, and that what is required of you in this is memory and devotion, memory and devotion. To keep your love alive, you must be willing to be obstinate and irrational and true. To fashion your entire life as a construct, a metaphor, a fiction, a device for the exercise of faith. Without this, you will live like a beast and have nothing but an aching heart. With it, your heart, though broken, will be full and you will stay in the fight until the very last. I love that. I'm going to read that last part again because it's just, I, I once heard a great poet read and he said, no one understands it the first time. The second time, everybody gets it. <laughs> All right, I'm going to do it real fast. I was graduated from the finest school, which is that of love between parent and child. Though the world is constructed to serve glory, success, and strength, one loves one's parents and one's children despite their failings and weaknesses, sometimes even more on account of them. In this school, you learn the measure not of power but of love not of victory, but of grace, not of triumph, but of forgiveness. You learn as well, and sometimes as I did, you learn early that love can overcome death, and that what is required of you in this is memory and devotion, memory and devotion. To keep your love alive, you must be willing to be obstinate and irrational and true. To fashion your entire life as a construct, a metaphor, a fiction, a device for the exercise of faith. Without this, you will live like a beast and have nothing but an aching mm. heart. With it, your heart, though broken, will be full, and you will stay in the fight until the very end. Thank you. <laughs>